Good evening. Welcome to SciArc. Um, I am Marcelo Spina and I'm a faculty here and I'm coordinator of uh, Applied Studies uh, sequence program. It's, um, it's, a pleasure of, it's a pleasure for me to actually introduce two good friends, uh, Eric and Mijan. Uh, Eric Holler and Mijin Young, uh, Mijin Young Studio, Holler Young Architecture. It's like a sort of a, you know, <laughs> really heterogeneous thing, but believe it or not, and it's another couple practicing together, and they actually, um, it's actually more cohesive than, you know, what the names uh, show. Um, I'll, I just want to write, I want to read a little bit of what they write. Um, of their work, just so you get an idea uh, what they think, and then I'll tell you what I think. And hopefully, there's enough time so they can lecture. <laughs> um, Holy Young Architecture slash Mission Young Studio is a multidisciplinary practice uh, operating in a space between architecture, art, and landscape. Uh, they believe in an embodied experience of architecture, seeing media as material, and its effects as palpable elements of architectural speculation. Uh, while their work lies at the intersection of the conceptual and the corporeal, I think this is a really important way in which they define, and I will definitely agree with that, of their work. They are committed to both the practice uh, of and prospects of architecture. Engaged in production at, at all scale, they are interested in the material realities and material effects of their work. From concept to construct, they are determined to realize the built idea and to test projects through the dynamic interaction between the construct and the larger public. Um, anyway, just these guys are one of the most prominent firms of uh, my generation. They have won all sorts of awards. More recently, they have been included in the Architectural League Emerging Voices. Uh, now they are, I guess, part of this uh, design vanguard um, you know, infamous uh, club at Architectural Record. Their work has been included in more recently for the LA community in the Skin and Bones show. Uh, they had been included in the Design Triennale in the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Um, anyway, and a number of other shows, exhibitions, and publications as well. Uh, Eric teaches at Harvard, MIT, goes back to Harvard, goes back to MIT, and it's, uh, it's, it, as he move, moves around. He worked at Dealers Cofidio, and was, he was actually, he was in charge of the ICA uh, project in, in Boston. Mijian is a um, uh, professor, no, still not a professor, it's associate professor. That's, that's the kind of right nomenclature. You know, she can get into trouble after. And this, it's associate professor at MIT, and where she carries most of the research associated with technology. Um, so, I tell you what I think. Um, the Sanford Quinter wrote about a very interesting text a while ago uh, called "A Materialism of the Incorporeal." At that point, he was actually probably talking about the sort of diagrammatic potential of unformed matters and and and, and inform, uh, you know, aspects of space. I think what's, what's interesting about, uh, you know, Mijian and, and Eric is that their work is able to actually, the work is fully material and it's actually, for me, part of a kind of a tradition and a new tradition of materialism without necessarily engaging all the time sort of physical aspect, the kind of more corporeal aspects of materialism, mainly formal aspects. Their work can actually bridge uh, you know, formal issues, and they deal with it in quite interesting way, but it cannot be quite simply reduced to only, you know, formal, uh, you know, a formal attitude. In fact, the, their, you know, their idea of materialism, I would say, spans across, you know, issues of materials as we know them, physical stuff and matter, but also they involve other kind of materials such as light, sensors, complex circuitries, and, you know, well-calibrated media all this kind of stuff that sometimes is, uh, it seems that is actually outside the reach of architects. It's actually very interesting in their work. So, um, while then, I mean, I just wonder why, you know, in material practice, it's often thought not to be able to be either 
conceptual or critical at the same time. And this is one of the things that for me is very interesting about seeing their work is that they are able to actually bridge between both. You know, they're actually fully involved in the materialism while also articulated uh, criticalities of their work and, you know, and a level of, you know, conceptual aspects as well. Um, of course, they're not really interested in just a definitely uh, define or, let's say, um, you know, more uh, specifically defined formal language, and that's what you'll actually see tonight. But that's not, that shouldn't come as some, uh, as a kind of form of criticism, but it actually talks about their commitment to a kind of broad a way of practice architecture. In fact, they call themselves uh, a multidisciplinary practice, and I will tend to agree with that, but I will add that their practice is actually, uh, it's quite specifically architectonic, because they actually, uh, they are actually interested in dealing with every project in, in a way that each project actually yields a particular set of conditions, particularities, opportunities, and they're not really afraid of you know, committing to them in a, in a sort of full potential. So uh, I'm personally more attracted to projects such as the PS1 loop, uh, which to me is one of the most inventive approach today to ideas of cellular organization in the way that they actually translate into material form with real materials and a form of tectonics, uh, or the defensive dress, which is one of the singularities of their, of their work. So uh, generally, it's a pleasure to introduce such a you know, bright uh, two architects. And personally, it's an honor to have friends at Sire. So welcome. Marcelo, thanks, Sire, uh, for having us. Um, can you hear us OK? Okay. Um, the title of the lecture is called Public Works, Projects in Play, uh, and we're going to talk about that as a kind of framework for discussing the work. It's a kind of varied body of work, and some of these terms uh, can be useful for, uh, for kind of framing the work. Uh, in terms of uh, public, we find that architecture often locates itself between the kind of private realm and the public realm, uh, somehow operating on that uh, public realm, or what is public about the public realm is some of the things that interest us. Uh, but also this notion of play. Uh, we're going to use play in a couple of different ways. Play as a kind of cultural activity uh, is one of the things that we hope to kind of produce through our work, uh, through a kind of understanding of event and, and uh, activity. Another notion of play is a kind of more mechanical one, which is having to do with materials coming together and a kind of tolerance or gap between materials that allows us to deploy them um, uh, in a kind of architectonic way. And a third definition of play that we're going to use is the notion of play as like putting something in play uh, as a kind of testing ground or a kind of uh, an activation uh, of, a, of an idea. So keeping those three notions of play in mind, uh, we're going to just show you some of the projects. Um, but think about the first one, uh, the notion of play uh, and the notion of rule sets, how play can happen in the public realm, how the body kind of occupies space in the public realm. Uh, but also how the kind of territory is defined through architectural or graphic or technological means. We're kind of attracted to the idea that uh, architecture produces a set of uh, conditions, spatial conditions or, or uh, rule-based conditions that are productive of conditions, uh, whether it's a kind of uh, the space of the city, in this case being used as a kind of stage set for a kind of event or performance piece, uh, or a kind, of, uh, a kind of conceptual art piece where the public is sort of interrogated to find out where its limits are in this case, uh, Vito Conchi following uh, the following project. Um, but the public realm, as you know, um, has been sort of re recalibrated or redefined uh, re in recent times uh, in New York. I noticed this in LA today. Um, and the kind of residue, the kind of architectural residue uh, of a kind of new understanding of public space that is more regulated, more defined, uh, and somehow um, needs a, a sort of reconceptualization. Um, just as Eric was explaining um, the kind of rule-based systems that construct organization or construct play, um, I wanted to also talk about these things that the cultural um, uh, constraints that actually uh, define or redefine our bodies and then the relationship of the body uh, to space. And the first project I wanted to show is the defensible dress. Uh, which basically uh, sets a, a, an opportunity to mark one's own territory by defending it. And so um, what it allows people to do is to uh, 
protect the encroachment of their personal space. Um, it does this by uh, essentially using a microcontroller, uh, which you can custom program with your kind of personal space dimensions in mind. Um, so this is the microcontroller that lights up. And then in terms of how this actually operates, there's a flexinol wire, which is basically a, a wire that contracts when it uh, is heated. And so what happens is that flexinol wire is inside a tube, and it's actually protected and grounded at one end. And when it heats, it act actually acts as a lever arm. Um, and so for us, our practice, you know, the dressmaker, the you know, electronics engineer, these things are combined. But in a goal not to, you know, design fashion, but actually to define relationships between personal space and public space. Um, this project actually uh, led to uh, a project called White Noise, White Light, which was designed for the Athens Olympics. And very similarly, there's a kind of uh, very simple rule set between one body and an effect that one body creates. And the idea was to create a, a, a field uh, which would allow for um, white light, which is the full spectrum of color, but also white noise. And the idea was that as a person passed through the field, that there would be a kind of one-to-one -one response, a kind of on and a fade and an off that would be triggered. The kind of interesting thing about project is that um, even though this, this kind of one-to-one -one reaction is very simple, the kind of quantitative scaling of the project actually creates a uh, qualitative effect. for movement in the wind and in response to the environment, but it also allows for response to the physical body. So the idea was that we wouldn't choreograph a design build project and it, it kind of shows the very simple architecture that's involved between the tube, the fiber optic which displaces the LED which exists in a module under the deck. Uh, and basically there's a very cheap outdoor speaker, $2.50, attached to a custom microcontroller underneath the board. And um, uh, basically for us the definition of architecture also includes the kind of electronics and so there's a part of the electronics that is of course custom printed but then there's a kind of incredible manual labor to this high-tech digital kind of process so these were the 400 speakers shipped to site working on site uh, to connect the wiring and then this is the deck and then the fiber optics during the day. And the idea was that it would be kind of invisible during the day. So really, you would only be aware of the kind of sound component of the project. And then at night, of course, it, it transforms. And the interesting thing about the project was not what we planned, but what happened after it was installed. And we noticed that the project would actually kind of create unforeseen kind of ways of social interaction within the field. People would invent games, actually, in Athens to play in the field, et cetera. Um, and so it was a kind of interesting step in this direction for us. 
Um, the next two projects uh, examine surface for their spatial potential, but also question relationships. Well, the first one between inside and outside, and the second one um, about a rule-based system. Um, this is a Japanese garment and a Western garment. And in the Japanese garment, what's really interesting is that um, size is actually taken up in terms of the gap or the tolerance. So they actually maximize the use of a material. And in, in a way, the kimono is um, totally driven by the, um, uh, uh, the dimensions of the fabric itself. And then individual sizes are made up for basically in the fold or the gap um, created uh, in the way you would wrap the material around your body, as opposed to the Western garment, which is which privileges the form of the body itself, and so it it's interesting to see the kind of remainder, the residue uh, left behind in, in the fabric. Um, so this project is called the Mobius dress, and it basically takes uh, a kind of little mathematical interesting thing, which is the Mobius strip, which is a topological surface with um, no inside and no outside. It's a one edge surface. Um, and it learns from the rules of kind of bisecting the Mobius strip or cu cutting a Mobius strip along its kind of one half point and then its one third point. And the idea of the Mobius dress was um, basically to allow the body to structure these relationships between this kind of compact manifold. And the dress itself kind of unravels along the kind of one third and the one half point. Um, exposing the kind of inside-outside relationship of the dress. It's essentially a dress that's, that's worn to be unworn. Um, and so this is kind of the template for the Mobius dress, and its operation is contingent basically upon two zippers that allow the dress to unravel and reveal the kind of inside-outside uh, to the garment. This is the dress at, a, at the SIGGRAPH show. Um, and then this is kind of the diagram for the, the dress itself. And basically it looks at a loop and the splitting of a loop when it has um, no twist, a half twist, a full twist, and one and a half twists in the relationship of the Mobius um, strip to the trefoil knot. Um, this is kind of um, examine further in terms of the relationship between surface and space in a project that was done in collaboration with 10 architectos for the Guggenheim Museum. Um, we were asked to basically design an exhibition of 400 Aztec objects which ranged in size from super tiny to, you know, eight tons in weight. And so the question of how to organize the exhibition became the kind of driver of the project. And the first thing we learned is when you uh, lined up all the objects in the rotunda, they didn't actually fit. So the first agenda was to create surplus surface. And by undulating basically in and out, uh, we were able to create surplus surface. And then because we have 400 objects, we had to develop a kind of rule-based system so that we could um, control uh, the kind of overall ribbon of the project because we wanted the experience to be this kind of continuous loop. And so the rules were quite simple that objects that didn't need to be behind glass would be pulled forward um, and would make a pocket in front of the wall. Pieces that needed to be behind glass for protection, the wall would actually pull back. And then based on the scale and your sight line of the object determined where along the on, on the elevation um, you could pull and push. Um, and so in working with the curator, we actually had to develop a system as a basic design tool to be able to control all 400 objects simultaneously. Um, so what we did was we placed all the objects in space and we knew basically all the local rules um, associated with, sh with each object in its specific pocket. And so we assigned those pocket parameters to every object, and then we were able to basically generate the wall, regenerate the wall, regenerate the wall as a design tool to kind of move and study with the curator the kind of locations in space, but also to study what in terms of the spatial conditions, um, uh, uh, in terms, what we would gain in terms of the spatial conditions. Uh, based on those relationships. 
Um, so the other thing about the Guggenheim is it's an incredibly central project. So we wanted to create a new relationship between kind of um, the center and the periphery. And so the idea is there are multiple centers now because you can walk down or walk up and then there's local relationships created as opposed to the main central one. Um, so this is the project installed on site. And we wanted to contrast with the Guggenheim itself. And so it's made of very dark, thick felt. Um, and the geometry of the undulations actually create a set of continuous experiences. Um, and here we would call it a vertical horizon that as you enter up the ramp, you can't see anything. But because of the relationship between your movement and the movement of the wall itself, it reveals specific objects at certain kind of threshold moments along your, along your experience. Um, and then every object, of course, gets a custom pocket based on, again, its parameters, its size, its scale, et cetera. Um, and then because the ramps themselves change when you go from the first floor to the top floor, they actually get deeper, uh, which allows for kind of these smaller kind of gallery-like pocket experiences. And what was interesting was also the acoustic effect of the project. It was clad in half-inch thick felt. And so not only did it absorb light incredibly, but it absorbed sound. And so you would go deep into some of these pockets and lose that quality of the Guggenheim where the sound kind of bounces around everything. And then on the sixth ramp, because it's a very different condition, we actually pulled the wall in and allowed you to um, inhabit or occupy both sides of this surface. And what we were able to do on this side was actually take um, the conditioned vitrines, um, which are environmentally conditioned. Um, and basically from below, you, you don't see anything. You see a blank wall. But only when you walk down the ramp um, do you see these and these kind of slivers between the wall, which actually um, helps with lateral support. But the idea was that you would come up, and then you would come down. And so it would continue that kind of continuous loop spatially as opposed to kind of physically in terms of the wall itself. And this is our like taxonomy of pocket noses. And then this is the view from, from above. Okay, uh, I'm going to show this uh, house project. Uh, we were asked to design a house for a, a family. Uh, they're empty nesters. Uh, their kids have gone to college. Uh, and they wanted to produce a house design that would sort of lure the kids back, and not just the kids, but their grandkids that uh, haven't, uh, that are unborn. So um, it is a kind of um, a reverse migration house, uh, but it's also a kind of post-nuclear family house. Uh, the idea is that there'd be three families living uh, within the single, single house, uh, so we call it a, a triple house. Um, the house is located uh, with this amazing view, and so our first impulse was just to kind of frame the view uh, with these kind of bedrooms. Um, but we were interested in sort of bundling three different houses, three distinct houses together, and then working on how the interaction between those houses would work. Uh, so we came up with uh, a kind of a series of repeated uh, sort of uh, houses that were sort of impacted and, and bundled together. Uh, so each house has its own kind of entry condition here with a three-car garage, uh, and a sort of independent access up to a kind of primary bedroom. Uh, but then slipping between these uh, surfaces, the different families could interact with each other and actually occupy a kind of shared sort of collective space. Uh, these are some of the studies actually going from the three-car garage to the four uh, window or th uh, four bedroom views. Um, here's a kind of section of the site showing the house kind of uh, prominently sort of jutting out over the landscape. Uh, and the plan shows a kind of repetition and variation between these three kind of uh, impacted or, um, or kind of bundled together houses. Um, the view from below uh, showing the, the, four, uh, the four bedrooms above, or the three bedrooms plus the, the kind of public uh, shared space, um, and then the kind of shared uh, collective space below. Okay. Um, I mean, this is, uh, that, that project we're still developing. This one is actually uh, different, but engaging some of the similar issues. This is uh, uh, an interior of the top floor of a six-story building in Chinatown in Boston. Uh, a couple uh, wanted to convert two apartments into one, and it's a live workspace. Uh, and so what we did is we introduced three um, openings and a kind of new interior sort of landscape. 
the apartments as they existed originally were kind of split by the structural uh, partition wall. We kind of made some surgical cuts in between them and then inserted these three kind of cubes of light, um, which produced a kind of condition like this. Um, here you see the three spaces. Essentially, uh, because the building um, as a center core, the interior is the most dark, and so by introducing these three uh, light welds, we're able to whoops, um, we're able to bring light into the kind of deepest, sort of darkest part of the apartment. Um, but what it does on the scale of the city is it kind of brings the city into the apartment, uh, making this kind of relationship between the, the top floor and the sky. Uh, so we call it as a kind of sky down space where we kind of pull the sky into that courtyard. Uh, this was one of the first sketches we did showing. A kind of um, a kind of packaging of nature within a kind of urban uh, off space. Uh, here, sort of during construction, and then here in the kind of finished finished uh, condition. Um, just looking at the plan, you know, there there are it becomes a kind of a continuous donut space uh, where you know living happens in the front. Um, we kind of replaced uh, an existing kitchen here. We turned it into the master bedroom, so we kind of. Uh, piggybacked on some of the plumbing that was already there. Um, this bathroom uh, became the courtyard, and the courtyard, obviously, because it's an outdoor space, uh, folded into an interior. Uh, the drainage from the previous bathroom is being utilized here. Uh, in terms of circulation, you know, you can kind of continuously cir circulate around, but there's also a kind of redundant path, and so the spaces uh, which are private, like the master bathroom, are part of the circulation uh, through the space. Here you see the space uh, where you walk through the courtyard, uh, the master bathroom, and this is also a kind of circulation path uh, through here. Um, each of these kind of bathroom elements sort of bring light into the, in this case on the left, it's a master bedroom uh, with a bathtub in the middle. Uh, and here uh, you see some of the, the kids sort of running through it, uh, sort of galloping around in this, uh, in this courtyard. Um, and then we kind of created a problem because uh, in Boston we have uh, severe snow uh, and so they asked what do we do now that you've made this eight foot by eight foot courtyard in our apartment. So we decided to design a inflatable plug uh, that would um, go in, you know, if there's a blizzard or a rainstorm. Um, so we designed it so that you could sort of see it from below hanging down. It's got a square uh, plan and a kind of s spherical uh, dome on the top. Uh, so here we are. We, um, we designed it, we kind of uh, unfolded it and produced patterns and then we shipped off uh, a set of documents to an inflatable manufacturer. Um, and ranging between $40,000 and $400, uh, we could produce this inflatable. Here's a prototype, uh, quarter scale. Okay, uh, shifting scales, this was a competition we did in Chicago. Uh, it's for a, a series of pedestrian bridges uh, located uh, here. This is Lakeshore Drive. Um, the thing about Chicago, as you know, uh, this is Daniel Burnham's fountain, which is incredibly monumental. Uh, and given the task of uh, somehow linking the park to the water, uh, we decided not to opt for a kind of vertical uh, or monumental marker, but instead to go with a kind of horizontal distributed or multiple uh, series of bridges. Uh, we worked with a structural engineer uh, in Boston who helped us uh, design these as post-tension um, concrete uh, bridges. Essentially, they're suspended on either end, uh, similar to a kind of structural diagram for like Dulles Airport, where you kind of string it up and then you sort of post-tension it to get almost horizontal. And somehow by multiplying the, um, the spans, we're able to uh, limit its uh, sway. So in a way, the kind of repetition or the redundancy of the multiple paths produces not just a kind of uh, a critique of the kind of singularity of the monumental fountain, but also serves a kind of engineering function of sort of stabilizing the bridge. Um, here you can see how that would work. Uh, apparently, it would only need to be one foot six deep with a kind of precast uh, module here strung up on the, on the existing cables. Once it's been installed, it would be uh, post tension, then concrete would be poured uh, back into it. So the precast panels become essentially the formwork uh, for the for the final bridge. Um, and here you see um, the supports. The supports we thought could also be used for um, 
for access to the bridge, and you see how the network sort of produces um, ways of sort of framing the views back to the city. Um, okay. Um, this is a project called Media Spill, and it was a project done for the Nam June Paik Memorial Competition. And uh, we saw it as the synthesis between the material and the immaterial, essentially the cast and the broadcast. And by working with the natural topography of the site, we wanted to preserve the forest. And so we used the re required program as a catalyst, essentially, to cast the residual space of the landscape. So essentially filling in this natural void with prescribed program, the museum creates a kind of congealed and tropic middle ground between site and program, between artifice and nature, and between art and technology. So media here in this project is used both as architecture and ephemera. It's a physical artifact of essentially an electronic Im image. And so the roof becomes the performative surface of the project, essentially its fifth facade. And it spans the site to become a kind of infrastructural armature, a liquid-like surface that converts light into electricity, displays electronic image, and provides natural light um, to the selected spaces below. Um, the curtain roof be becomes an operable variegated surface of photovoltaic plasma and glass panels. Um, and it enables the museum to generate its own electricity and create a surface that displays both its production and its consumption of that energy. Um, so the pixels are essentially interchangeable um, and they can be used independently or collectively on the site. Uh, and it creates a kind of mediated graphic landscape for the project. Um, internally, there's two trajectories of movement, one pedestrian, one vehicular. Uh, so it's essentially a drive-through and a walk-through museum. Um, and these things happen kind of um, simultaneously in the project and allow for kind of chance, chance encounters. So it incorporates both strategies. Um, it incorporates both strategies and um, that are choreographed and creates moments of kind of accidental opportunities. So it's a, both a container that transmits its, its content. Okay, so um, going back to this idea of the public realm, we're, we're interested in the way people behave in the public realm, uh, and if that behavior can somehow be architecturally induced or uh, enabled. This is actually a public art project by Rafael Lozano Hammer. And, um, um, and then we're kind of intrigued by this image of Vito Conchi sort of shadow boxing and the relationship of a kind of individual to his, own, his or her own shadow uh, and the way that that might play out in public space. Um, so this is a project that we did following the White Noise, White Light project. This one's called Low Rise Hi-Fi. It's actually for um, an office building in Washington, D.C. And the owner um, came to us, they own this building, and they came to us and said, uh, can you do something uh, for us? Uh, they're sort of essentially recasting this building uh, in the real estate world, and they thought that some sort of interactive public art piece might help them. Um, the site is actually just north of the White House here, the little red dot, um, and the sidewalk is enormous. It's 41 feet deep and 177 feet long. Um, the existing lobby, you can see here, uh, was being uh, refurbished, uh, and so Looking at the situation, the site is actually in the parking zone, which is historically where um, horses and carriages would turn around. It's actually part of the public realm, but it's uh, constructed or maintained by the owner of the building. Uh, so this was the site as we found it. Uh, the 25-foot depth became a real uh, sort of desolate uh, territory. Um, we proposed a number of interventions here, three um, we called Lightstream, three vitrines uh, that contained uh, graphical information, and then this area here, which we call the Sound Grove, uh, which was meant to be a kind of interactive um, light and sound space. Um, the vitrines you see here, they're, they're somehow between inside and outside, slipped um, from, from inside to outside, and in the back, the third vitrine in the elevator lobby. Essentially, um, we produced an LED net uh, which could contain any sort of graphical content. The owner was interested in some way of rebranding the, the property, uh, and he wanted the building address uh, to be displayed. So the building address is uh, 1110 Vermont Avenue, which we 
interpret it as these ones and zeros, which produce a kind of graphic backdrop. And then the idea was that a, a digital shadow would be captured by a surveillance camera and then broadcast into the vitrine. So here you see um, one of the first concept images we showed him. The ones and zeros form a kind of graphic backdrop. And then the live feed of the surveillance camera is overlaid on that. So as you come up to the project, you kind of discover your own image and you find uh, ways to overlay your image on the sort of official content. Here's uh, the diagram showing the surveillance camera uh, and the interaction between the kind of official content and the user. It looks like a real shadow, but it's actually got a, a slight delay. Um, and watching people interact with it, they sort of discover their own image uh, and then sort of take pleasure in erasing uh, the actual uh, content, which is uh, the, the owner uh, provided. Yeah, I, I think for us, for this project, well, we wanted to make clear that we didn't control the client, that that was, I mean, we didn't control the content, that that was up to the client, but we controlled the ability to interact with that content. And so this idea of erasure as being that interaction was, was critical for the project. Okay, so um, in order to do this, we looked at several products that might work. Uh, we didn't find any that suited our needs. We wanted the screen to be absolutely transparent and occupying the space uh, on the sidewalk. So we developed uh, a two-sided uh, LED custom pixel. Uh, here's the pixel. There's essentially a circuit board printed on here, and uh, it's suspended by wires which both uh, uh, support it, um, produce power, and um, address each pixel. So here's a prototype where uh, the pixels are being addressed individually. Uh, they're um, arrayed on these strands. Here the strand is uh, being tested. And finally, sort of arrayed across uh, to form this grid. It's, it essentially produced a screen with a very low resolution uh, image, but the screen is absolutely transparent. So you can see it from both sides. Uh, and you can see you know, other people on the other side. Um, what we discovered in the process of developing this, which was a real kind of R&D process, uh, we had to develop a new piece of technology with the help of uh, electrical engineers. Um, but this new, this vitrine, uh, I mean, I like to say that it's got a kind of, it's got an envelope, it's got a kind of structural system, it even has a kind of HVAC system uh, because the vitrine has to be cooled uh, in terms of, uh, we don't want it to overheat. So here's a kind of construction document of this kind of small, uh, interactive art piece, but it actually has all the kind of um, all the symptoms of architecture. Here's the piece uh, being um, behind a piece of acid etched glass, so it kind of diffuses each pixel. Um, here's another video. Yeah, it's the same one. But um, the other thing that's important about this project is it really plays with scale. So when you're really close to the vitrine, you don't really understand its content, you don't recognize its content, you're just kind of aware of things turning on and off. But someone who is, you know, 30 feet back actually can see that content very clearly. And so this idea of kind of playing with proximity and your understanding of kind of content relative to your proximity, I think was really important to the piece. And then also the fact that it would kind of stream content from inside uh, to outside um, was also something we wanted to, to work on. So the, the idea that you would just kind of come across it and then it would kind of make you aware that you're being surveyed anyways on this property. So the idea was to use the surveillance cameras that are already on site, but then to, through reflection, refraction, diffusion, actually create a kind of opportunity for people to engage uh, the project. The second component of the project is the, the hi-fi part, the sound growth. So we thought it'd be interesting, you know, given everything's high definition, to do a very low resolution kind of visual content, but to really kind of elaborate on a kind of sonic experience within the public, public realm. So the idea was to create a kind of uh, urban instrument that the public could engage and play. And this time, instead of using proximity sensors, we thought it'd be interesting to use um, touch. And basically, there's capacity sensing here, which allows you to touch each segment and essentially trigger sound. 
Um, basically, we started with a diagram of what we wanted in terms of the sound, that there would be a sound in a rest or a sound in a space, a sound in a space, a sound in a space, but that each of these would be designed such that you could never um, create any repetition. So, you know, learning from Brian Eno, the idea of very simple kind of structures overlaid on each other to create <laughs> and it required basically like white noise, white light, and the defensible dress, a lot of custom architecture to match custom circuitry. And this is a donut circuit board. We think it's an original. There aren't that many donut circuit boards out there. And the reason it has to be a donut circuit board is it has to inhabit the space between the structural inner pole and the outer touch capacity sensing pole. So this was a design build project. Um, this is us kind of soldering all the components on the circuit board. Um, and then the squid, which is the brain that you see at the top that controls the lighting of these boards. This is basically the um, pole, all the segments of the poles. And then basic, they come together one by one and then they're tensioned with the inner structural pole. For us, the importance of this project is that it, we wanted it to be less dumb than white noise, white light. The idea is to bring in some network intelligence. So we thought it would be interesting if every segment was aware of what it was doing, but also aware of what every other segment in the field was doing. So we could create a kind of network behavior between the sound elements. So there's basically a short sequence that you can trigger depending on which one you touch, and then there's a longer sequence that you can trigger. Um, so Similarly, um, we thought it would be interesting if basically the sound would travel in space um, and that certain sounds could trigger its kind of um, related sounds in the space and that through the interaction of the public that these, this, would, like, this complexity of the network system could be multiplied. The, the idea of um, design build or kind of interactive light and sound spaces um, and we find that we'll have an idea about how we think a space should be uh, used or activated and then we try to figure out how to do it and uh, like the previous project uh, there, there is no precedent for that kind of um, that kind of project so okay so this next one um, it's called light drift it was proposed for a four point channel in Boston it's essentially uh, a set of uh, floating elements that are um, uh, uh, lighting elements, but are powered by uh, solar power. Uh, we we're interested. I mean, we're interested in um, we're interested not just in the kind of wired technology, but we're interested in, in making these things wireless and so somehow um, self-sustaining or not sort of connected to a kind of stationary power source was important. So this one was developed. Uh, independently of any sort of power source. We use uh, flexible uh, photovoltaic film applied to a, a translucent uh, polycarbonate shell and then uh, LED lights within it uh, to illuminate it. So here's a, a kind of a rough uh, prototype. We looked at some tiling patterns to see how these things could aggregate uh, to form a kind of continuous surface but also kind of drift apart uh, and form a kind of a larger pattern in the water. Uh, an exploded accent of all the components. Here are the kind of rough prototype. Uh, our first sort of launch uh, in, in the 
Charles River. Uh, and so this one we're developing further, but it, it is trying to sort of, uh, sort of step away from a kind of wired power source and, and look at other ways to generate power to sort of visualize how it's sort of produced, but also how it's consumed. So this is the last project we're going to show, which is our entry for the PS1 MoMA competition a couple years ago. Um, the idea for the project was basically to pack it with program. We thought that instead of creating a sculptural object in the middle of the space, it would be more interesting to fill it with, with activity um, and avoid kind of designing a object within the courtyard. Okay, so um, we looked at uh, precedents for what kind of object would fill the space completely but not uh, be solid, so uh, bubbles. So bubbles, uh, cellular structures seem to suggest not only a kind of metaphor but also a kind of structural logic. Uh, a bubble obviously containing the maximum volume with the minimum amount of uh, material. Um, we're also looking at a mathematical principle called the Voronoi, uh, which uh, divides space, in this case two-dimensionally, but we're interested in a kind of three-dimensional sort of compartmentalization of space. Um, so using uh, this principle, uh, we deployed a series of points in the space of the courtyard. Uh, those points, um, through a, a computer script, produce a kind of three-dimensional kind of cellular compartmentalization. And this, the lines of the cells were then kind of uh, rounded off uh, and then projected towards the center of each cell to produce uh, this kind of dense lattice, uh, which um, ultimately was rendered as a, as a kind of two-foot ring or loop structure. Uh, that kind of nested together to kind of self-support itself. The, the brief, as you know, um, is a infrastructure for fun, right? Um, every year, um, they commission a young architect to sort of build this tomb a few years ago. Um, but they, they really want a kind of an infrastructure which incorporates um, bathing, drinking, seating, lounging, uh, and all kinds of other activities. Um, and sun shading, I guess that's one of the, the primary ones. Uh, so instead of just uh, working on a canopy, we thought that the, kind of the way it's actually supported uh, should be uh, part of the same logic. So it's not about support and, and sun shading, but the whole thing produces um, everything out of one system. Yeah, and we hope that it would become this like completely occupiable uh, lattice work. Uh, and so, you know, when we kind of pitched the project, we knew that they wouldn't believe that this system could really be occupiable. And so that's kind of what we spent a lot of the um, energy on. Super fun. Okay. So we didn't win the project. Everyone, the, the winners always come from SciArc, never from from Boston. But um, but it was very important for our, our practice to engage in this project in terms of thinking about this occupiable infrastructure that kind of generated opportunities for play, but also kind of structured potential new ways of inhabiting architecture. So, um, I mean, one of the first questions they asked is, how would you build this thing? Uh, we don't believe you. Uh, so we had to show them a little bit about how we had actually developed it. Uh, clearly, it's, it's uh, sort of developed somewhere between a kind of material investigation. We began with kind of folded paper. We took it into Rhino, we kind of modeled it in Rhino. Uh, we used some computer scripting to sort of generate points and, and generate the initial uh, three-dimensional Voronoi. We then unrolled it back out and found ways to optimize uh, the, the cutouts uh, on large five by 10 sheets. Um, the question was, what is it made of? Uh, we looked into polypropylene as a material. Uh, polypropylene's 100% recyclable. It also has a kind of a wonderful um, so, hey. Yeah, it, it, it kind of deflects and it has this great bounce. 
so we thought we could exploit that kind of material property uh, to produce the loops, uh, which would actually be very lightweight, but with enough kind of um, bundling, they would support their own weight. Uh, one of the things Eric didn't mention is that when we basically unrolled these things, we found that the optimized uh, condition was basically a C that was then forced into a circle. And so that C condition, when it's forced into a circle, creates a kind of conical section which adds structural stability. So it's not that the loops themselves are being cut, but um, the kind of conical section, in fact, is being cut. So you can see the kind of rigidity and bounce of a very thin material. We worked on um, um, ways to connect it, and so polypropylene can be welded, and like steel, the weld joint is actually stronger than the material surrounding it. Uh, and then the question was, how do we create the parts that are physically occupiable? And so we found a giant oven um, about an hour north of us, and we uh, created these molds, and we asked these people if we could use their giant oven to cook our project. And, and they said, okay. And so um, we basically made these molds that clamped uh, the polypropylene and allowed us to heat form the, the material. Yeah, so, I mean, most of the material would be very thin and very lightweight. The parts that you sit on would actually be half inch polypropylene. So we developed a couple of different um, chair options. They're both looped and welded together like this. Uh, you can see how those would work here. And we actually built a small sort of cellular prototype uh, to prove that it could be done out of three sheets of polypropylene. And uh, we couldn't get it out of our system even after we lost, and so we decided to continue on and, and make a, a few other pieces. Um, and I just want to conclude by um, saying that for us, Public Works Projects in Play acknowledges that unpredictable conditions are integral to the architectural project. Um, it merges the predetermination of a rule-based system with the unanticipated and contingent opportunities of the field. Um, and by field, I'm talking about both territory and our disciplinary field of architecture. So our projects create environments that elicit playful modes of social behavior from uh, an activated public. For us, play is not just the desired end, but a mode of maneuvering architectural form, network technologies, and materials in order to construct environments that invite individual and collective participation. Thank you.